Okay. Okay, I am speaking today with Denise Duhamel and Rick Mulkey. I'm very pleased to be doing this interview and I hope you all enjoy it. I'm going to jump right in with Rick. And I think you know who he is, but he's the director of the Converse um, MFA program. And um, I'm just going to jump in with my first question. Rick, what inspired the poem Cured, dedicated to Albert Goldbarth? <laughs> Actually, I'd, I'd like to say it was something, you know, really impressive and literary. But part of what, there are a couple of things that inspired that poem. Um, one, one is that Albert and I, for many years, have shared this, this love of bacon. Uh, and uh, I, I, have, I have received from him over the years all kinds of little gifts, including like a little bacon, bacon wallet one, one year around my birthday, and just other little bacon items. And so that, that was part of it. The other part was he had asked me, um, I, think Green, I think it was Green Mountains Review was doing a special issue on Albert. And he had asked me to to write uh, an, an essay for that, that issue about him and our relationship and, and his work and my thoughts on his work. And I had written one for Georgia Review a few years uh, before, and, and I, was, I was starting to work on it a little bit. It, it was the beginning of a sabbatical for me, but I was so focused on trying to write poems that I sort of put the essay aside and instead of writing it, I started writing a poem that very quickly became a poem for Albert. And so I sent him that poem with, a, with an apology saying, I'm not gonna have an essay for you, but just so you know, I love you, here is, here is this poem. So. Well, it's a fabulous poem. And oh, knowing, having met Albert Goldbarth um, down here once before, I really truly appreciated it. And I suppose now I'm gonna have to ask you to read it so that our listeners can uh, understand what I'm talking about. I'll be happy to. So this is Cured for Albert Goldbarth. Albert, I'm here to tell you Bluefield, Virginia has the best bacon in the Eastern US. I know you've never been there, but it's the kind of place you might visit on a Sunday, clear blue sky and mountain ridges frosted when all the evangelicals in their aging chapels and strip mall sanctuaries are off to pray that folks like you and me won't turn their fruitful lands into a salty waste, and you'd be left alone, or nearly so, in the only diner open on a Sunday morning. Just like me, you'd be lured in by the satisfying aromas of peppered pork belly, the sensation of eating the blistered fat of swine. We wouldn't care that it was spiritually unclean or that all it touched was unclean, the unclean plate, the unclean scrambled eggs, the filthy toast and jam, the way our fingers lathered in its fatty sweetness were unclean and our mouths unclean or the BLT we'd order to take with us, piled high in bacon, unclean. And later, as we walked the empty streets before the local parishioners labored out to find their way home to sanctify roasts, they'd ravage from pristine platters. You and I and our friends would grow hungrier and hungrier as we'd compare the subtle flavors of acorn and truffle, the sugary, salty depth of pig. Then you'd quote from Su Shi, Marshall, or Matthew's sensuous song of swine, sui generis, and we'd agree that eventually we'll all be offered up on one altar or another, salted with fire and smoke, salted with age, salted in baths, entering a covenant of salt, cured, if you will, of any worries about what might come to pass tomorrow. And knowing this life is the one life 
and wanting to make the most of it, we'd pick up a glass of very cold, very sweet tea at the Dairy Queen, and we'd unwrap our sandwiches, drink deeply from the cup, and eat of the crispy flesh, satisfied celebrants of this porcine priesthood. My mouth is watering. <laughs> <laughs> your your one thing I've learned about your poetry is your descriptions just really engender uh, response, whether it's salivary or emotional or um, joy. I really uh, get a visceral response to that. Um, oh, well, thank you. The the other poem uh, that really just I wrote in the book. Wow was gestation. Oh, okay. yeah. And oh, that's so nice. I, I have to admit, I, you may be the first person who's ever mentioned that poem to me. Oh, I, I I'm, I'm well, you can't, well, maybe you can. I double checked it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, it was, um, it was, it was a poem. I, I'm not even sure now I can remember exactly how it, it started. Um, it had been, there were lines in the poem that had been part of other poems that I felt just weren't working. And uh, I, I had sort of pulled a couple of those lines out and, and I was trying to do something um, with them. Um, my, my mother about 15 years ago died of cancer and um, I've never really been able to write much about that. I wrote about her a lot before her passing, but I found I've, I've had a harder time writing about her after. And so she was certainly on my mind as I was writing that poem. And I was thinking about her during my childhood when um, uh, I grew up in a little part of Southwest Virginia. Um, and we had a big, huge garden every summer and my family canned lots of, you know, our, our food for the year. And um, I just remember the, the image I have of her there is just sort of in the sweltering hot day uh, out on the, the sort of porch or car, I guess it was really a carport. And she was just sitting there just, just sweating and miserable and pregnant with, I can't remember now, but it was the third or fourth child. Um, um, but yet also there was something so, lovely about her there too and that that memory and so all, all of that for me was sort of what I was thinking about I guess as I wrote the poem and just sort of remembering her a little bit. It's a beautiful poem and um, just really filled with love. Would you like to read it or is it too? I, I would, thank you, yes, I would. Gestation. Above plowed rows, the, the sun turned hot and sour while she tested the shade of maple leaves. Pregnant and sweating from her morning's labor, bushel basket of beans to snap and freeze, she rocked the front porch glider. Its song, phrased more with rust than metal, suggested all days are brief and passing. Flies hummed and fresh turned compost and manure, which each spring constructed her garden. Corn and squash she'd can and shelve would soon come on, then later she'd pickle crocks of beets. Meanwhile, the child inside her wrenched and kicked, and years before they'd wake, cancer cells deep inside her breast cleaved to their fertile sleep. Uh, that, that way you imagine that, it's just uh, really astounding. Um, right. And not just because I have a poem named Gestation too. It's quite, quite different. Um, also, it's a sonnet, right? You it is a sonnet. Yes. Yeah. Right. It That's is a right. sonnet. Yeah, it yeah. was um, that, that particular time period, I was really trying to um, I, I didn't care if the poem finished in a form, but I was trying to write in forms. And then if, if it felt okay in that form, I left it. And if I needed to change it, I did. But, but a lot of that was because 
I, I'd been watching Denise over the years write in form so often, and I thought, wow, she's so good at this. Let me let me see what I can do a little bit, see if I can do anything even close. Yeah, that's that's interesting you say that because one of my questions for her is about her forms. Yeah. Um, yeah, form is really, you know, people sometimes give form a bad, bad rap now, but I find it has a resurgence and there's yeah. just something about form that really makes us think harder. And your poem just is beautiful that way. Well, thank you. Um, the curse poem, I have to say, taught me a lot about how a poem goes through all kinds of places except sentimentality your poems oh good, good. um even though the subject matter is extremely sentimental and and hard to deal with uh personal but your poems are so evocative and it really just goes all over the place um i'm gonna ask you to read that poem but i also want to ask you um well i'll i'll ask you after you read it it's okay. about the last line okay uh, I will say I'm, I'm, I'm glad you felt it didn't fall into the sentimental. I, I will say as I was working on that poem, that was one of the concerns I, I had was to make sure that it, I, I tried to avoid that as much as I, I could. Um, I, I will say there's a little bit of language in here early on. It's a little, a little hard. And, 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 and at least one word that I will say, I don't think I've ever uttered other than in this poem it makes me so uncomfortable so so this is a poem I rarely read so I, I appreciate the opportunity to read curse poem it would be easy at the end of a day of demoralizing disappointments and misanthropic misdemeanors to let loose with a series of fucks motherfucks and goddams science even suggests it might make us feel better if not force the world to make sense. It's what my son assumed when he was seven and with his mother when they nearly came as my high school coach, most vulgar man I ever knew used to say, as close as a cunt hair to a head-on collision. He turned to his mother, both breathless with fear and said, it makes me want to say something bad. Go ahead, she offered, which he did his first F-bomb exploding its syllabic shrapnel across the dashboard. For a moment, he did feel better. Though feeling better is not what this poem is about, or feeling worse for that matter. This is a poem about language, words to be specific, and how they can profess love or rage, how they can enlighten or disguise, endear or destroy. How a 15-year-old girl alone and living on the streets can be convinced to perform acts she couldn't have imagined by a pimp sharing a bubblegum pink icy and telling her in the words she longed to hear from her country clubbing mother and cheating father, I understand you. Maybe we all are cursed by our various lexicons, cursed to describe and explain, cursed to extol, cursed to pretend, cursed as much by the start of day, good morning, as we are by the close of day, good night. Cursed to believe we can comprehend any of it. There are, of course, those who say words are incapable of expressing meaning or mean something other than what we try to express. Jeffrey Eugenides suggests we need Germanic train car constructions in place of single word emotions. No room for joy, but rather the happiness that extends disaster. Maybe the long married couple piled into their king sized bed, all that empty space around them have it right. She's watching The Late Show with Stephen Colbert, and he's reading Anna Karenina, considering how there are no conditions which a person cannot grow accustomed. He's listening to her laugh at jokes not nearly as funny as, he, as his own when he wonders why they practice what not to say until they say nothing effortlessly. And why not this silence? given there never were enough words or the right words for love's many hungers 
Yet it's words a son tries to find at his mother's deathbed. She's gone, at least her mind is, and she's lost all words by now. Can't say them, can't form them on her dried lips, possibly can't even recognize them. And still he's looking for the right ones. He knows he'll remember these words even if she won't. He knows he'll take them with him after others have said more words in the church and more words by the grave. And late at night, months and even years later, he'll wake to those syllables, each vowel of pain, each consonant of guilt, forming a sentence that sours on the tongue. And in that night, he'll hear his mother's voice as he did as a child when he cursed her for being his mother. I will make thy tongue cleave to the roof of thy mouth that thou shalt be dumb. A kind of curse, she repeated as she forced his head to the sink, lifted the soap and scoured every word from his mouth. That poem just goes so many places. So I got to know, did she really wash his mouth out with soap? Uh, she did. <laughs> she Even did. after inviting him? To oh, not that, not, not, not that time. No, I'm thinking about my own mother there oh. washing my mouth out with soap. Okay, <laughs> yeah, I wasn't, I wasn't quite sure whether the later person was your yeah. son grown older or you. Um, which is why this poem impressed me so much is it went so many places and then just really the ending is just amazing. Um, okay, talk about your influences from other writers on your work. I noticed that a lot of your work is after or for and is uh, this kind of influence necessary for the creative process? Well, there, there, there are all kinds of people that I think have been influential, some of them in probably ways that seem obvious, maybe even too obvious, others in ways that I think probably aren't as obvious. Um, you know, for me, I think of people like Jack Gilbert and Linda Gregg as very influential. I, I, I think the way I think about description um, yeah. on some level comes from thinking about their work, but, but also, uh, Hayden Carruth, uh, there's a poem in here that's sort of after Hayden Carruth poem, um, whose work I've, I've loved for many years and, and admired, and I think maybe has some influence there. And then certainly uh, Albert Gobarth, who's been a, a, a mentor to me for many decades, I, I think. Um, but even going back, I, I, you know, I think, you know, I was reading people like Whitman, who I've always loved and not just the longer pieces of his but some of the shorter pieces of Whitman too um, um, and then I you know again this is one that may not be uh, clear because I think our poems are really very very different um, but I, I've always thought of Denise as someone who was <laughs> it, it influential um, you know to some degree partly in just the way that I admire her her work ethic and her approach and uh, as well as her poetry itself. So I think all those things and, 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 and yeah, I think, I think those influences are really in, important um, for me in terms of writing. I, I don't know that I could ever just sort of sit down and begin writing if I weren't reading. Reading is absolutely an impart, important part of that process uh, for, for me. So I, I, I'm always, uh, reading a lot of poetry and even reading a lot of fiction, short fiction especially, uh, when when I'm when I'm going through periods where I'm trying to do, you know, a good amount of writing. So I, I think those influences are really important. Yeah. I uh, I get inspired. I've written quite a few poems that were sparked by uh, a novelist or a line yeah. in a novel. It just, in fact, I've got one just, you know, written out, and I haven't written the poem yet, but certain words and phrases just really yeah. hit me. I once had a student who said, oh, no, I don't read other people. I don't want it to influence me. And I almost hit the ceiling. I just, <laughs> oh, people that person's influenced read. whether they realize it or not. Yeah. They are, and it's very important to read other people. Oh, um, Absolutely. 
your book, All These Hungers, is about way more than food hunger. Talk about the title and how that evolved. You know, um, the, the title, um, I, I sort of went back and forth on the, the title and tried, tried different versions um, and, and always ended up coming back to it. Um, partly because, as you said, it's not really a food book, though there certainly are lots of poems in there that, that use food and either directly or metaphorically. And so there is that, that kind of hunger. But I always had sort of lurking in the back of my mind um, a quote that I remember writing down years ago when I was an undergraduate, actually, from um, a Georgia Eliot book. And honestly, off the top of my head, I don't remember which book it was now. It may have, uh, I'm, I'm not sure. So I'm not even gonna try to, try to guess because I'll get it wrong. But, um, but the quote was something about, um, about we can never give up longing and wishing um, wh while we're alive. I mean, that's sort of a paraphrase of it. And there's, there's more to it than that. But that, that sort of quote about the sense of longing and desire uh, as, a, as a way of defining us, that, that, that kind of hunger becomes, a, you know, becomes an act in itself, right? That it can never be satisfied. And so I, I was thinking about that I was, as I was working on, on the poems in this book about how so many of those desires, there really is no way to satisfy them. The desire itself becomes sort of self-perpetuating in some kind of way. So I, I was thinking about those things when thinking about the title and thinking about the individual poems. Well, there are so many poems uh, in this book about the different kinds of hunger that people experience, the, the longings. Uh, it's a primal urge. All animals are driven by hunger. Yes. Um, you know, they're just one hunger or another. I think it's a very appropriate title for your book. Thank you. Um, in your own books, do you have favorite poems? And would you like to read one from this book? I, I always, I always do. They're often, <laughs> they're often only my favorite, not someone else's, I guess, which is, which is often the case. But th there are a couple. But yeah, let me read. Um, let me read one of them. Um, and. Um, this is um, um, this is a poem that sort of deals with the different kinds of hungers, I think, uh, than, than the sort of food ones. So I'll read it. Um, and since I, I've read a couple of poems dealing with mothers, this one's sort of directed to, toward a father figure. Uh, and it's a poem called Toolbox. Mm. When he gave me the one his father had given him, he said, a good tool invites you to pick it up. His were hands that held many, knew the difference between the weight and balance of a ratcheting wrench and a spark plug wrench. His were arms that lugged power tools, hand tools, vintage woodworking tools, garden tools, and a lunch pail of the kind no one owns anymore. His was a back bent beneath the labor only men and women used as tools can know bent in the bean fields and hay fields, bent by shingles carried up the roofer's ladder, bent by the concrete mixer, bent by the sledgehammer and shovel, the jackhammer, the hoe and spade, the engine block. His were palms that knew other palms by their calluses or lack of calluses. Knew my hands were hands familiar with keyboards and ballpoint pens and understood those were tools too. Knew we all were tools of war and power, tools of lust and loss, tools that eventually lost their use, grown weak from age, rusted from neglect. When he asked me to help with repairs after a storm, I knew this was work he could no longer do alone. I brought the toolbox with me. I handed him a hammer and waited to follow his lead as I always had, knowing sometimes trying is all that's asked, sharing the small losses this tinkering with our hands can almost fix. That, yeah, that really touches me. My dad 
you know, when I first moved into this house, he came with a big container filled with nuts and bolts and nails of all sizes and screws and, and things I have no idea what they were for. And he said, you have to have this in your house in case I need something. And I was the only girl, so out of three boys. So he taught me how to use some tools here and there and I can fix windows and a few things he was a glazer so oh. I really related to that poem I have it checked <laughs> so I'm glad you read that it's Thanks. one of my favorites um last question uh how many revisions would you estimate you make to a poem Ooh. Uh, or do they feel like they pour forth unhindered I wish they poured forth on it. Um, I make lots and lots of revisions. I mean, I really couldn't count some of them. Um, I, I will work on um, even a poem that seems to come to me pretty quickly is a poem that I'll work on for weeks. Um, and most of them I, I'll work on for months. I'm a I'm very slow writer. Um, I, it takes me many years between books to finish them because it takes me a long time with each poem um, before I'm sort of relatively satisfied with it. But but I would say I would say there are some poems in here that I mean you know I probably have you know 50, 60, 70 drafts of of an individual poem. Sometimes those drafts may be you know small changes to a phrase or something like that, but but I, I would say, you know, a minimum a poem goes through 25, 30 different drafts. Do you, do you keep all those drafts? I do. I, 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 uh, I start out handwriting each poem. Mm -hmm. And then after I've written through several drafts of it that way, I'll, I'll go ahead and uh, you put it into a computer and print it off. But I print off every, every draft, even if I just change a word, a word or two, I print those off because honestly, I'm sometimes I'm, you know, I'm not sure, did I make the right choice or not? And I don't want to lose, you know, the previous version if, I, if I've made a mistake, so. I hope you have investments in a paper company. <laughs> <laughs> I, I keep the revisions mostly on my computer, so, yeah. Sure, and, I, I, and I, a lot of people do. I, there's just something about it. I, I like to have that, that physical form there, and I like to be able to write on them and circle on them. Yeah, yeah, I can write too. Okay, well, that concludes my questions for you on all these hungers. Thank you. We, um, we are going to move to talking with both of you about the anthology. Great. Great.